Warhammer 40k has a remarkable ability to take a tried and true fantasy trope, give it that old grimdark twist, and turn it into something wholly unique and far more badass. But more importantly, this new and improved version of said trope still manages to hold on to the spirit of the original, the core identity that made it so beloved and iconic in the first place. And nowhere is this practice more beautifully implemented than with the Imperial Knights, a quite literally households full of knightly nobles pulled directly out of Earth's ancient history, who instead of riding horses into battle, pilot 30-foot tall war machines, bristling with some of the most destructive weaponry ever utilized by mankind. If you're not immediately on board with that concept, then there is no pleasing you. But their lore is so much deeper than just being a bunch of badass mechs. These guys go way back, predating the Imperium of Mankind by over 10,000 years. A fun fact, all the way back during the Dark Age of Technology, they weren't strictly seen as engines of war. For all intents and purposes, they were basically giant logging equipment. They were seen as utilitarian machines, designed for mining, clearing forests, building houses, pretty much everything that humanity's early pioneers would need, while also coincidentally being capable of absolutely obliterating any raiders or treacherous xenos that would threaten the human settlers. But what role do these Imperial Knights play in the 41st and 42nd millenniums? How were they utilized in war, and what are they all about? Who are the knightly nobles that pilot them, and what is the horrible ritual that supposedly they have to undertake in order to successfully bond with their suit? Is it true that each and every one of these mechs contains the ghosts of dozens if not hundreds of individuals that piloted them in the past? What are all of the different types of knights, and which ones are the most powerful? And what role does the Adeptus Mechanicus play in all this? Because they're technically two separate factions, but they seem to be intrinsically linked. Well, in this video, we're going to get into all that and a whole lot more. As you could probably tell by just looking at the length of this thing, there's a lot to cover with the Imperial Knights. But before we do, I got to tell you all about this amazing t-shirt collaboration I just did with the sponsor of this video, Into the AM. If you know me, then you know I'm a big fan of Into the AM's graphic tees. As everyone down at my local game store, or any of you who have met me out in person will attest, I wear these things just about every single day. Their designs are loud, colorful, and over the top in the best possible way. They're ridiculously comfortable and also shrink and fade resistant. A true story, I've been wearing these shirts for over two years now and none of them have experienced any shrinking or fading or anything like that, no matter how many times I send them through the wash. Also, the absolute best thing about them to me is they're about 20% longer than a normal t-shirt. So if you're tall or wide or somewhere in between, Into the AM shirts always fit perfectly. Now, as I said, I'm a huge fan of their product, so I was absolutely blown away when they reached out to me to collaborate on a t-shirt together. If you've been watching my videos for a long time, then you know my favorite thing to talk about is the spooky, creepy cosmic horrors from beyond the realm of human comprehension. And the design that we came up with together perfectly captures that essence while honoring into the AM's iconic style. But seriously, their artist always manages to knock it out of the park, and he did a fantastic job with this one. If you pick up one of these shirts using my link, I'll actually get a commission off of every single one they sell. So if you want to help support the channel, then click on that link today and pick up one of these shirts for yourself. And I'll just tell you right now, if this collaboration goes well, we've been kicking around a few other ideas for shirts in the future. So go to IntoTheAM.com today, using the link in the description of this video. And while you're there, use code WESHAMMER at checkout to save 10% off your entire order. Again, that's code WESHAMMER at checkout to save 10% off your entire order. Big thanks to IntoTheAM for sponsoring this video. In the grim darkness of the far future, the history of old Earth is something that has mostly slipped into the status of myth and legend. With the dawn of each new millennia, more and more of the ancient documents that cataloged our distant past have ended up either being selectively purged by the ruling powers or lost in the fires of war. However, despite the lack of surviving records, some legends can never truly die. They only adapt to the times. Now, way back in humanity's past, there were stories of armor-clad individuals bedecked in the heraldry of their clan and household. Warrior nobles who fought not only for king and country, but to uphold the values of chivalry, honor, and fealty. These valiant soldiers would stride into battle atop their trusty steeds, fearlessly charging into the enemy ranks as the foe's projectiles ricocheted off of their armored forms. They would descend upon their quarry in a righteous frenzy of armored fist and flensing steel, heedless of their own safety. They stood defiantly in the face of evil, and while they persisted, no citizen would need fear what lurked beyond the borders of their kingdom. The legendary deeds of this heroic warrior caste were said to be so awe-inspiring 
that even after they had long since vanished from history, they would continue to inspire generation after generation for millennia to come. By the time of the 30th millennium, humanity had emerged from the horrors of the Age of Strife, united under the leadership of the God Emperor of Mankind. They would set out into the stars to reclaim the galaxy which was theirs by birthright. But the darkness was encroaching, seemingly without limit. A call for aid was cast into the void, one that rippled not simply across space, but also back through time. This call would end up being answered by the legendary heroes of old, pulled directly from our ancient history. Like the proverbial phoenix, the noble knights rose from the ashes once more to stand against the darkness and the vile tides that sought to prey upon humanity. Although these valiant warriors still clutched tightly to their ancient culture, code of ethics, and notions of chivalry, they would not survive the transition into the far future entirely unchanged. Whereas before, they marched to war atop living beasts of burden, they have left these steeds in the past in exchange for something far more appropriate to the change in scenery. Now charging into battle atop towering 30-foot-tall bipedal war engines of mass destruction, each driven onward by piston-driven limbs and wielding an arsenal of weaponry that makes every single one of them the equivalent of an entire military regiment. Every single Imperial Knight, as they are known, is piloted by a highly trained noble whose mind has been saturated with the concepts of chivalry, honor, and fealty. They march to war to the sound of blaring war horns and hymns of praise sung to the ancestors over box speakers their banners shimmering in the wind, and the very earth itself shaking with every thunderous step. Every single one of these armored giants is capable of shattering battle lines with ease, unleashing devastating bombardments of roiling energy and mass reactive shells that reduce entire enemy forces to nothing but blackened ash and molten slag. Although their massive frames are impossible to truly hide from the enemy, even if this could be done, they would never utilize such shameful cloaking technology. For every knight believes that although what they face is pure evil, every foe deserves to be honored. They must look them in the eye as they end their wretched lives. Now, Each and every one of these war machines is bedecked in brilliant colorful heraldry that shines proudly for all to see, magnificently intricate designs that tell all who witness them of victories won and honors claimed. They inspire hope in their allies and strike fear in the hearts of the enemy. The knights want to be seen, they want to be heard, and they want their foe to know that they will not escape their judgment. To a knight's pilot, their suit becomes something of a second skin, their vision replaced with its auspex feed, and the movements of the suit becoming indistinguishable from their own. Their tactical decisions will end up being guided by the data ghosts of their ancestors that flood their mind with whispered wisdom and demands for honorable combat. This is all accomplished through a series of neural impulse links that are built directly into the knight's throne itself, allowing the pilot to operate their war machine in a symbiotic relationship. Piston and servo motors hiss and whine as they thunder forward in loping strides, plasma reactors rumble to life, and exhaust vents belch billowing clouds of smoke into the sky above. Ancient power floods through their armored limbs, and their massive firearms crackle with arcane energy as their gargantuan chainswords roar into deafening life. Ironstorm missiles streak from launchers built into the knight's back, detonating amongst the enemy ranks and showers of gore as Avenger Gatling cannons spin to speed, screaming like a chorus of damned souls as they spray hundreds of thousands of rounds into the enemies of mankind. In the face of such a terrifying enemy, the foe breaks, clawing over each other in desperation in a futile attempt to escape the knight's wrath. All those not killed in the initial barrage will be obliterated by the roaring teeth of the enormous chainswords or crushed under the bulk of their thunderous footfalls. A single knight being deployed is enough to turn the tide of even the most grisly of battles, but when an entire lance deploys in full force, victory is almost certainly assured. Their martial strength enough to conquer entire star systems in the Emperor's name. No matter the foe they face, no matter the battlefield they deploy to, as the knights still stand, honor, courage, and nobility shall prevail over hatred and rage." So with all that said, what are the Imperial Knights and what are they all about? Well, at their core, the Imperial Knights are enormous warsuits that are piloted by a member of a noble household, often referred to as a Knight Scion. These individuals have undergone an ancient ritual known as the Becoming to form a symbiotic bond between human and machine. All of these suits are controlled by knightly households, absolute ancient civilizations that predate the Imperium of Man and control an enormous amount of power in their own right. In fact, the knight worlds have often been considered to be the third great human empire next to the Imperium and the Mechanicus. 
To me personally, what I find so remarkably interesting and endearing about the knights is that at their core, they are quite literally knights straight out of ancient history. Except for, as I mentioned in the intro, instead of riding horses, they pilot massive mech suits instead. And there's something just so unabashedly cool and uniquely Warhammer about that concept. Night worlds are named as such because they are ruled over by one or more knightly households. In the vast majority of cases, a night world has a variety of night houses that exist as their own distinct entities, but are in alliance with one another. When you have a single house that rules the entire planet, they are referred to as a great house. Each and every one of the night houses will construct for themselves a massive sprawling castle of ferrocrete and adamantium incredibly defensive bastions from which they will rule over the world's population and store hundreds if not thousands of their knight suits, as well as teeming garrisons of household militia. These castles are said to be incredibly formidable and are often swaddled in layers of void shielding, meaning that even when war does come to one of their planets, the fortresses are very rarely taken. Fun fact, supposedly a lot of these keeps were built upon the landing sites of the original colony ships, and if the rumors are to be believed, many of them still have somewhere in their skeletons bits of material from those ancient vessels that were utilized in their construction. Sometimes these fortresses will be built into the side of a mountain or deep within a shadowed forest. It's different from world to world, and every household across the galaxy has their own unique culture and traditions. From the beginning, the night worlds were always self-reliant. It's not that they don't trade with other planets, as they certainly do, but they don't allow their planets to be completely stripped bare and have every form of industry set up, so if the worst was to happen and they would be cut off from the rest of the Imperium, they would be able to continue on by themselves. Compare this to something like an Imperial Hive World, where if there's a single misshipment of crucial resources, or something like a delivery from an Agri World ends up getting delayed in the warp for a few years, they could be facing mass starvation. If you were to visit one of these night worlds, you would see webs of strip mines, agriplexes, and breeding paddocks, pretty much everything they would need to keep their population fed, protected, and for the most part, happy. It's interesting because on one hand, they directly resemble a feudalistic society mixed with just enough science fiction elements to make sure we don't forget that we're looking at a world in 40K. On the surface, they may appear primitive, but when you take a deeper look at some of their machinery, some of these worlds possess some pretty remarkable designs found nowhere else in the Imperium. Although how these ancient machines work has long since been forgotten, and the vast majority of them were destroyed or lost thousands of years ago, the few STC-built Dark Age of Technology machines that remain are seen as marvels of engineering. Some churn away deep underground, excavating steady flows of minerals, while on the surface, vast armor glass greenhouses play host to a wide variety of barely understood machines that stimulate crop growth. It's a really strange mix of rustic and futuristic elements mixing together in a wholly unique planet type. Most of the people that live here are not part of the ruling elite and the knightly houses themselves. They are simple peasant folk, legions of faithful artisans and skilled guildsmen that still live and die within a handful of miles of the place of their birth. For all intents and purposes, they are happy and satisfied with their lot in life, and most commonly, know little to nothing of the larger Imperium. They pay their tithes and trade with other worlds and human factions, but it is the Mechanicus that they have the closest relationship with, and thus it is also the Mechanicus that will reap the most significant portion of all resources generated by the Night World. At least once per year, an envoy of tech priests will arrive to much pomp and ceremony, wherein they will bestow upon the knightly houses an array of new knight suits and replacement components in exchange for harvested resources. Imperial knights, nobles, and households can all be broken up into three major categories, Questor Imperialis, Questor Mechanicus, and the Freeblades. Questor Imperialis knights are the ones hailing from knight worlds that have sworn allegiance to the Emperor and Terra, whereas Questor Mechanicus knights have sworn allegiance to Mars and the Mechanicus. And the lone entities known as Freeblades are singular knights that can come from either one of these worlds, but have forsaken their households for one reason or another and set off into the stars to fulfill their own personal quests. Questor Imperialis worlds exemplify what we think of when we think of a techno-feudalistic fiefdom. Their territories are ruled over by nobles, with the lower population being responsible for manual labor, toiling, farming, hunting, mining, and producing in their liege's name. In exchange for their loyal services, the nobles of the ruling class protect the peasantry from invading Chaos and Xenos forces, as well as maintain political stability within their borders. High-ranking local leaders are normally referred to as barons or baronesses, all of whom serve under the world's high monarch. 
Sometimes these worlds are ruled over by a collection of different knightly houses that have all entered into some form of alliance with one another, whereas at other times, an entire planet can be ruled over by a single great house. Most of the time, these worlds do not have a massive population like other Imperial planets, and due to their long history of being isolationists, they're not bustling centers of industry either. They take from their world just as many resources as they need to continue to survive, as well as pay their tithes to both the Imperium and the Mechanicus. Political squabbling is certainly commonplace amongst the nobility, and although culture and tradition will vary from world to world and house to house, it is common for disputes and disagreements to be settled through knightly jousts and honor duels. However, regardless of what any given noble's opinion of their peers is, if the High Monarch calls the houses to war, all disagreements must immediately be set aside to take up arms in either defense of the planet or to march to war against the enemies of the Imperium. To refuse such a commandment is considered an undermining of the High Monarch's efforts in favor of personal gain, and is said to bring an enormous amount of dishonor to both the individual and their house. Ironically though, life on a night world such as this can get kind of dull, and the nobles are always looking for any excuse they can get to jump into their suits, so it takes little in the form of encouragement to get them marching to war. A war offers them an escape from the tedium of courtly life and the day-to-day -day responsibilities they have during peacetimes of attending to the needs of their serfs, dealing with administrative matters of state, or conducting the long esoteric rituals that have grown in both length and complexity over the millennia. Whereas Knights of Questor Imperialis worlds are privy to a lot more freedom to pursue their own interests, the Knights of Questor Mechanicus worlds, on the other hand, are tied directly to the interest of the Mechanicus itself. They will regularly be called upon to defend Forge worlds they are bonded to, accompany the tech priests on missions to recover lost technology, eradicate outbreaks of tech heresy, defend mining worlds, join exploratory fleets, or support the Titan legions in battle, regularly aiding the god engines as scouts or flank guards. And fighting alongside the Titans is considered an enormous honor, as Questor Mechanicus nobles are normally deeply ingrained in the dogmatic traditions of the cult Mechanicus and firm worshippers of the Omnissiah. To them, there are few greater symbols of the Omnissiah's divinity than the god engines themselves. A great deal of Questor Mechanicus households are actually located on the Forge worlds they are bonded to, whereas the ones that do control their own planets operate on a feudal system similar to their Questor Imperialis cousins, but they do differ in some considerable ways. First and foremost, they have considerably less culture and martial autonomy of their own due to the vows they made to the Mechanicus. They are also often regularly visited by conclaves of tech magi, who, although will bring new resources and night suits, also bring a considerable amount of scrutinizing eyes. The heraldry and symbolism adopted by Questor Mechanicus nobles also routinely takes artistic inspiration from other members of the Mechanicus. The symbol of the cog will often be embossed on their armor, and they will routinely wear robes stained red to symbolize their devotion to Mars. Many of them will even adopt the tradition of taking electrically charged tattoos under their skin known as electus, as well as a whole host of mechanical augmentations. At first, it may seem like Questor Imperialis worlds got a better deal. But that's not necessarily true, as being entered in such a close alliance with the Mechanicus means the Questor Mechanicus nobles benefit from easy replenishment of stocks of armored suits, weapons, and munitions, and are thus almost always well equipped. They're able to replace their losses much more quickly and mount fresh crusades at a much more rapid pace. Additionally, because they have for all intents and purposes become part of the Mechanicus, have started worshipping the machine god, and have been blessed with a considerable amount of sanctified augmentations designed specifically to help them better synchronize with their suits, the bond Questor Mechanicus pilots share with their suits is nearly symbiotic. It is a far more natural pairing than the one shared by Imperialis Knights. The nobles of these worlds are no less proud and honorable than their Imperialist counterparts. They still rule their vast domains, march out to protect their borders, and swear ultimate fealty to their world's supreme ruler. An individual that often ditches the title of High Monarch to instead take on the revered title of Princeps, which you may notice is coincidentally the same title used by the pilots of Titans. So that should give you a little bit of an idea of just how much reverence they have for the Mechanicus and the Titan Legions. Mechanicus Knight pilots are said to be more somber in appearance and temperament than their Imperial brothers and sisters. They are less unruly and willful, and due to them not having to worry about the dual loyalty of their sacristans, have a much better relationship with them. 
Their battle doctrines are bellicose, expertly cogitated, and derived from sacred logic rather than stubborn, honor-bound nobility often plagued by hot-headed temperaments. When their lances march to war, they do so with devastating efficiency and absolute unified conviction. A knight can end up becoming a freeblade for a variety of different reasons, some good and some bad. It may be something as simple as during a particularly violent battle, they ended up marooned and alone on a distant world, having to fight their way across the star single-handedly to make it back to their house. Or in some cases, it's possible that their household was completely wiped out, leaving them as the last remaining member of their family. Other times, the noble may have dishonored themselves in some way and committed some unforgivable mistake and as punishment have ended up being cast out of their household. Or it may have been something that the knight decided they had to go off on their own and do. They had some personal quest or vendetta that honor demanded they pursue, but the household refused to give in to their blessing and they were getting in the way. The only way to undertake this quest was to leave behind everything they had ever known and forsake their house, a decision that is not to be taken lightly, as once a knight declares themselves to be a free blade, they will never be allowed to return. Ultimately, Freeblades are lone knights that wander off into the void of space searching for a worthy cause to uphold. Many may pursue one specific objective, whether that be righting some great wrong, seeking vengeance on a hated enemy, pursuing a quest of personal importance, or in a lot of cases, just wandering from battlefield to battlefield across the stars as a lone operative, showing up wherever they are needed the most. Some may end up becoming rather reclusive, fighting only to protect what they deem as personally valuable whereas others may end up being driven mad by their isolation and the circumstances of their exile. Some Freeblades have been known to be murderous destroyers, silent avengers, proud warriors, and some particularly legendary Freeblades have been said to have supernatural abilities. The Legend of the Obsidian Knight, for example, being a particular favorite amongst members of the Astra Militarum. The first sighting of this Black Knight was during the Damocles Gulf Crusade over 200 years ago, where out of nowhere, he strode out of the darkness, covered in fell symbols, and single-handedly halted a Tau river crossing, choking the river's waters with the bodies of alien dead. He would then seemingly vanish into thin air, reappearing over and over across the decades in dozens of different notable battles, always disappearing without so much as a single word. No one knows who this guy is, what he fights for, where he goes, or if it's even the same knight that keeps showing up. There's also the individual known as Durantius, the Green Knight, also referred to as the Forgotten, that is said to reside in the center of a sacred mountain atop a blessed peak that rises from the heart of Alaric Prime's largest island. Supposedly, he stands guard over an ancient vault of lost archaeotech, making sure that it never falls into the wrong hands. If the rumors are to be believed, then he has stood guard over this place and the world itself for thousands of years. Whenever the planet is threatened, he rises from his slumber once again to bring death to all of the enemies of Alaric Prime. No one who has ever seen the Green Knight has successfully managed to communicate with him. Nobody knows who he is or if there's even an actual living person inside of the suit. The only thing that we know for sure is that whenever the planet is threatened, the Green Knight will be there to defend it. Freeblades often travel alone or with a small retinue of like-minded individuals that either believe in their cause or were loyal to them before they became a Freeblade. These individuals normally take the form of retainers, sacristans, or loyal bondsmen. However, it's also not uncommon for Freeblades to end up meeting a lot of interesting people during their travels, all being drawn together from the same war zones and finding in each other something of a kindred spirit. During their travels, they may end up working closely with members of the Inquisition or even rogue traders, and may become part of a ragtag crew set on pursuing their own agenda across the void. No matter the company the Freeblades keep, where their travels take them, what personal honors they've enjoyed, or tragedies they've suffered, in their hearts, they are and will always be a Knight Scion, an individual that places great importance on acts of honor and duty. They may have left their house, and they may have broken their vows to their families, but chivalry is something a Knight can never forsake. And thus, wherever they go, they will often fight tooth and nail to protect the citizens and soldiers of the Imperium and punish all of the foes of mankind. It's important to remember that the knight itself is simply a tool, a steed to be ridden into battle. Without a noble to pilot it, it is nothing more than a hollow shell. It is the human component that is the core of every knight's suit, both its mind and its heart. When both the human and mechanical elements are capable of working in tandem, the pilot becomes a veritable demigod of war. But how exactly does one become a knight pilot? When a noble comes of age and is considered worthy to become a knight scion, 
they will have to undertake an ancient ritual known as the Ritual of Becoming, or more often, is simply the Becoming. This is where the young noble will attempt to bond with their knight's suit and wrangle its belligerent machine spirit into submission. Only the most truly worthy and disciplined of individuals have any hope of breaking such a beast to their will. You can imagine it like somebody trying to train a bucking bronco or a wild stallion by leaping up onto its back, except in this scenario, instead of just getting kicked off, you'll either be killed, left in a vegetative state, or go irreparably insane. Knights are controlled through a system of neural interface links and mind impulse control units built into a pilot seat known as the Throne Mechanicum. When a pilot is successfully bonded to their machine and they link up to it, the knight's suit itself becomes something like a second skin. The device allows them to control the suit as if it was an extension of their own body. When the day comes that they must undertake the ritual, all of the aspirants will be taken into the sprawling chambers of their house's sanctuary, where household Medicaid units and sacristans will subject them to invasive surgical procedures, installing in them the necessary augmetics to interface with the throne. Skull sockets and neuro interface plugs are implemented, physical imperfections replaced with augmetics, and stimulant injections delivered to deep muscle tissue and bone cores. These surgeries are pretty traumatic and are normally performed with minimal anesthesia as to test the character of the young nobles. However, it is said that no matter how painful the surgery, it is nothing compared to what they are about to face in the Chamber of Echoes. When they are deemed ready, they will be taken deeper into the sanctuary's heart where they will be presented with a number of empty throne mechanicums taken from the knight that they will eventually pilot. They will each sit upon the throne of their household and the sacristans will plug them in. As the ancient machines were to life, the sacristans will extinguish all of the torches in the room, plunging the aspirants into darkness before retreating and sealing the chamber. They have done all they can for them, and now their fates will be placed solely in the hands of the ghost bound within their throne. It is at this point that each and every one of the young nobles will attempt to bond with the knight's machine spirit locked away in the core of the throne. But it's not just the machine spirit that they'll have to confront, but also dozens if not hundreds of data ghosts, each and every one of them one of their ancient ancestors that piloted the night before them. The spirits will race to the forefront of their mind and induce a series of vivid hallucinations, walking nightmares, and shuddering fugue states. Strange nerve impulses will shoot up and down the aspirant's body, causing them to twitch and convulse. To somebody witnessing this ritual, they would hear in the darkness the aspirants muttering and moaning, weeping and sobbing, screaming out in terror, or convulsing with spontaneous laughter. As the ritual proceeds, they will over time begin to lose their connection to the real world, eventually being plunged entirely into the churning sea of ancestral spirits, their mind and soul being sucked deep into the neural network of their throne. It is at this point that they must find their inner strength of character and rise to the challenge of subduing all of the echoes of the past in order to drag themselves back to the present. Under normal circumstances, one out of every ten of these nobles will end up losing their lives, their minds completely burnt out by the neural feedback or their sanity shattered by the hallucinatory trauma. Many more may end up surviving the trial but are left in an irreparable state of madness and insanity, unfit to fulfill their role as a noble, let alone as a knight scion. Those who succeed with their sanity intact, however, will end up imprinting their personality upon the throne seizing its neural space as a general seizes a fortress, figuratively planting their flag for all to see. The next morning, when the sacristans return and relight the torches, the boys who had entered the night before now emerge as men, their brain chemistry having been altered and the tapestry of their souls rewoven. Their personalities will be permanently changed, altered not only by their knight's powerful machine spirit, but also the touch of all of their ancestors most often being left with a lingering sense of duty, fealty, and nobility that will end up coloring their deeds and decisions forevermore. However, this is a two-way street, and the Throne Mechanicum, and more importantly, the knight that it is a part of, will also absorb some of the personality of the new pilot. Sometimes this can shortly leave the knight itself skittish and twitchy, whereas other times they become somber, aggressive, stubborn, or unflinchingly courageous. Over the millennia, a knight suit will absorb dozens of neural imprints from generations of nobles, each one becoming a different aspect of the suit's personality. From this moment forward, the knight will awaken an answer only to the pilot that bonded with them, until, inevitably, they end up killed in the field of battle, wherein their spirit will simply become just another ghost within the machine.
In all honesty, the next thing that I want to touch on is probably something that was better off being left on the cutting room floor as it doesn't really add a lot to your overall understandings of knights and knightly households. But I thought it was cool and this is my video, so damn it, I'm going to leave it in. When doing research for this video, I was actually surprised to learn that the throne mechanicum could be removed from the knight itself. I assumed that the aspirants were sitting inside of the cockpit when they undertook their ritual. And fun fact, these thrones, which for all intents and purposes are the mechanical brains of the knight, are not even traditionally stored within the knight itself when not in use. They are instead stored in a huge dome chamber at the very top of the household sanctuary known as the Communion Dome. When the knights are commanded to assemble for war, their pilots will ascend to this dome and sit upon their throne. Neural cabling will clunk into their skull sockets, and the throne will tilt backwards and slide smoothly into a waiting transit tube. It is then that the noble will plunge hundreds of meters in a matter of moments, grav cushioning and mag rails ensuring that their descent remains controlled. This exhilarating fall will take them all the way through their sanctuary down to the vault transcendent, where their knight waits for them, carapace docks yawning wide. The throne will spiral into a final delivery shaft, thumping neatly into place at the heart of the knight. It is then that the rising thrum of engines will fill the vault, paired with the clatter and whine of locking bolts securing and spinal plugs mating. Claxtons will howl their war cries, and the snarl of reaper chainswords revving to life will announce that the pilot and steed have successfully linked as one, the noble's heartbeat now pounding in rhythm with the throb of the suit's reactor. For the nobles, the bonding with their suit is the truest expression of knightly virtue. It is the sole reason they exist, and is everything they have trained for. It's been stated on numerous occasions that many pilots tell others of their experience and say that it's kind of impossible to describe. No one can possibly hope to understand quite what it's like to command a knight's suit unless they've done it themselves. It imparts a power and thrill that is undescribable, to look down upon the battlefield from atop their war machines as a god of war, delivering carnage and death to anything that crosses beneath their shadow. The experience is said to be incredibly addictive, and when separated from their suit for too long, the knight scion's mental health can suffer greatly. Anxiety, panic, depression, all these things are commonplace, and the only cure is to experience the exhilaration of loping across the battlefield as a 30-foot-tall war engine once more. The effects also aren't always purely mental in nature. Degradation of the individual's mind, body, and spirit over time are commonplace, as being bound to such an ancient and powerful machine spirit takes its toll on the pilot. It's not uncommon for older pilots to end up completely losing use of their legs. Their vocal cords end up atrophying, and their minds slowly lose touch with reality. However, those who have experienced the thrill of piloting a knight will tell you that the experience is worth the sacrifice. So I'll be honest with you, I didn't know where else to put this section in the video, so I'm just going to plug it in here. And that's the topic of gender when it comes to knight pilots. It's stated in the Imperial Knight Compendium that under normal circumstances, the right of succession says that only men can become knights, and the right to pilot one of these suits is reserved for the first and second son of a noble. However, this appears to not be a hard and fast rule across all of the different households, as we've seen a lot of different examples of female knight pilots over the years. Jenica Tan Draconics, for example, became the first female knight within House Draconis on the world of Astropol, and this was a pretty major plot point in the Nightblade and Kingblade books. Additionally, in Book 2 of the Dawn of Fire series, the Gate of Bones, we're introduced to House Kamadar, ruled over by High Queen Orla Yi Kamadar. Her daughter, Princess Jezevain, was the pilot of Questor's knight in Sendor, who led a full force of five knight lances during the Battle of Gathalamor. There's also Mohana Moncada IV, who, after having been denied the right to pilot a knight because she was a woman, despite the fact that she won the horseback riding competition to decide on future knight pilots, would end up exiling herself and joining with the Mechanicum to found the Legio Solar Titan Legion, that for a big period of time was entirely piloted by women. I know Titans and Knights aren't exactly the same thing, but I thought that it was an interesting and relevant fact to bring up here. Also on page 50 of the 8th edition Knight Codex, when speaking on the practice of taking on a consort to continue the noble bloodline, it speaks of these consorts as either being male or female, which indicates that the knight pilot in question could also be male or female. What this all means to me is that it is correct to say that knight pilots as a whole are mixed gender, but the asterisk on that statement is that due to the prevalent conservative and patriarchal nature of a series of ancient civilizations modeled after the feudalistic medieval societies of old 
Earth, who are also famed for being deeply opposed to change, it's also fair to assume that the majority of knights are men, especially on imperialist worlds. At the end of the day, opinions and cultures differ from house to house and world to world. Some are going to be more progressive and some are going to be more conservative. If you want my personal opinion on the matter, I would assume that Mechanicus-aligned houses will likely end up being a lot more ambivalent in this department, as they're heavily influenced by the Mechanicus's culture, a faction that has by and large transcended primitive flesh-based concepts like race and gender in the pursuit of instead emulating the sacred form of the machine. To a knight scion, there are three things that are tied in their heart for the most important thing in their life, their knight suit itself, their honor, and their heraldry. To a noble, their house and personal heraldries are both deeply important to them. They represent the purest expression of who they are, what deeds they have achieved, and what honor they have earned in battle. This is why throughout the ancient halls and keeps of a knight world, a noble's heraldry is used to judge their worth. A lord can read the tale of a noble's deeds simply by observing the icons on their banner, understanding who they are at their core, as well as every important moment in their life without ever speaking to them themselves. This is why after every single battle, a knight pilot will go to great lengths to ensure that every piece of damage to their banners and colors are repaired, at least a noteworthy deed be lost behind a plasma burn or under a torn piece of armor. People who are unfamiliar with knight culture may believe the knights to be vainglorious, gaudy nobles that refuse to use a piece of equipment unless it is decked out in fanciful imagery. Some individuals may even look down upon the nobles as weak or foolish, for what use is there for pageantry and an abundance of decorations in war? Their assumptions could not be further from the truth, and it is dangerous to underestimate the knights, as each and every one of those medals is a sign of a legendary deed every symbol the mark of a great triumph earned in blood. To earn even the most basic of heraldry, a noble must prove himself as a skilled warrior and a man of remarkable honor. To wear the icon of their house is not a right simply granted by birth, it is an honor that must be earned. Regardless of the history of a house crest or any of its symbols, a knight will wear it with pride, as it connects them with their past, all of their ancestors, and a legacy that often predates even the Imperium itself. Every single aspect of a house crest or a noble's heraldry has deep significance. Every curve on a shield or shade of color is important. From the number of feathers in the aquila to the framing of a crest, how many swords surround a shield to even the number of rivets in a helmet, every element has meaning. The symbol of a shield, for example, may represent a great hero of the past, whereas a diamond or a spade may represent one of the house's holds or principal keeps. Some symbols may represent important dates, alliances struck, or promises made. It's also pretty commonplace for a knight to include in their own personal heraldry some type of symbolism or, at times, actual written names to represent all of the pilots of their suit that came before them, making sure that their legacy is never forgotten. These pilots realize that one day their name will be etched upon the same banner, as one of their descendants takes the reign of their noble steed. The heraldry of the knight houses has evolved over time. Back before they became part of the Imperium or the Mechanicus, their heraldry was limited to portraying the kingdoms and realms of their own planet, and thus traditionally were a lot more simplistic in nature when compared to modern heraldry. However, once they joined the rest of mankind during the Great Crusade, their heraldry would begin to expand. The designs became more complex, with far more elaborate symbolism. This is when we first started seeing the Imperial Aquila show up within knight heraldry, and over the millennia, it has become one of the most commonly recognizable symbols utilized by the knight households. More simplified designs may use wings flanking a crest, an eagle soaring overhead, or a series of crossed swords. With every new generation of nobles, more and more great deeds end up getting recorded within the household's ancient libraries, and thus their heraldry so too continuously adapts. However, it's worth pointing out that this can be an incredibly slow process. Heraldry doesn't change overnight. When a deed is considered worthy enough to be recorded in the heraldry, the implementation of this change can actually take a really long time, sometimes hundreds or even thousands of years after the occurrence of the event. This is due to the inherent stubborn nature of the noble households, who since their earliest days have viewed change as anathema. What is far more commonplace is heraldry only temporarily changing to mark a particularly noteworthy campaign or crusade. For example, a lord may add a particularly iconic weapon or color to the house crest during the duration of this specific war, denoting a special honor to any of the knights that bear it. 
These changes can often be incredibly subtle, some so seemingly insignificant that the untrained eye may overlook them. But to a noble of that house, the change is immediately obvious and instantly understood. Whenever a knight scion is killed in battle, tradition dictates that all of his personal icons and heraldry be sent back to his homeworld, wherein these banners will be hung in the halls of their keep alongside those of their ancestors, so future generations may look upon their deeds and remember their glory. Aside from just the house crest, knights will wear a variety of campaign badges, battle honors, family iconography, oath marks, rank indents, and all manners of other symbols they deem important. Some of these symbols represent personal glories, great victories that will inspire others who see them to fight in a similar manner, whereas other times these symbols can represent a deep personal shame, a failure in the knight's past that they do not wish to forget, the symbol serving as a permanent reminder of their quest for atonement. Fun fact, when it comes to forms of address, all of the knight worlds use different prefixes and suffixes that date back thousands of years. Most simply use terms like sir or lady, but there are also many tales of far more esoteric naming conventions being utilized. It is said that there are as many of these complex honorifics as there are stars in the imperial sky, and a common trend amongst the households is to take great offense when a noble's title is not utilized properly. With that in mind, it should come as no surprise that imperial authorities will often continuously persist in their attempts to learn all of the naming and title systems of all of these worlds, as they're considered a vital part of communication efforts with the knight pilots in battle. Let's take a look at a common knight banner to get a better understanding of the symbolism that they tend to utilize. This banner belonged to Sir Montaran of House Terran. You'll often see banners like this hanging from a knight's carapace, their weapons, or more commonly, from the pistons that drive the machine's legs. We can roughly separate the banner into two halves, the top and the bottom. Now at the top, we will see the crest of House Terran. Every single knight from this household will carry the same sigil in the same location on their banners, but beneath that, things get a lot more personal. All of the symbols here come to represent specific kills, honors, and campaign markings, and will differ from individual to individual. These markings often are dependent on where they have served and what honors they have gained. Banners will look different from house to house. Some favor more simplistic designs, while others can get a little bit more eccentric in their symbolism. Oftentimes, kill, campaign, and honor badges will use a mix of local iconography and sigils used by the armies of the Imperium that they have fought beside. It's not uncommon to see symbolism here used to honor members of the Astra Militarum, the Custodian Guard, Sisters of Battle, Space Marines, Imperial Navy, Skitari Vanguards, etc., etc. If from a knight's perspective, the time they spent fighting alongside such worthy allies deserves to be recorded in their personal heraldry, just as much as any of their own personal deeds. There are a ton of different knight suits, but in order to keep things simple, we can roughly categorize them into five distinct patterns, that being the Armagers, the Questoris, Dominus, the Serastus, and Acastus patterns. Kicking it off with the smallest pattern of knights, we have the Armager patterns. Now, these guys are normally piloted by lesser nobles or elevated house guard, and although are often thought by outsiders to be lesser when compared to the larger knights, they are conversely viewed by their household as an essential part of any knight lance. They each stand around 19 feet tall, and due to their smaller frame, are much more nimble than their larger brothers and sisters. In fact, nimbleness and mobility is something that all knights are commonly praised for when being directly compared to the god engines of the Titan Legios, as Titans are essentially a walking fortress, whereas a knight is meant to more closely emulate an actual bipedal human combatant. And it's definitely true that all knights are capable of a more fluid range of motion than a Titan but the armagers take this concept to an entirely different level, as their reaction speed and fluidity of movement is said to be almost one-to-one -one when compared to a flesh-and-blood human. When moving at full speed, they're capable of outpacing both tanks and transport vehicles. But despite their quick nature and smaller frame, they're also capable of wielding some pretty ridiculously powerful weaponry. In war, they are deployed as fast-moving flanking units that are able to quickly move in and destroy critical targets or break apart enemy lines, opening up the enemy's defenses in order to make room for their larger siblings. What's particularly interesting to me about these guys is that they don't actually utilize a throne mechanicum like the bigger knights, and because of this, they don't require a full-fledged ritual of becoming in order for their pilots to bond with them. But we'll get into all this a little later in the video. 
Instead, they have what is known as the Helm Mechanicus, which is like a smaller version of the throne that, although still allows them to directly interface with their machine, comes with one major difference in that the Armagers, and thus its pilot, will be bound to the will of a nearby Questorus Knight Preceptor. It's little wonder that these are sometimes referred to as hunting hounds, as they are quite literally leashed to a higher ranking noble. And listen, the following of orders is one thing, it's something that all nobles are trained to do from birth, but this is a little bit more invasive. It is to have your mind, body, and soul, all of your thoughts, feelings, and the entirety of your free will be utterly and completely dominated by another. Now, feelings of anger and resentment when subjected to such mental domination are pretty commonplace, and there have been many armager pilots in the past that have broken off and gone freeblade after being subjected to it. Because of this, it's imperative that all armager pilots train at the side of a knight preceptor before they're allowed to assume their knightly duties beside their bond leech. I like to think of these guys kind of like squires to a knight. It's not that they don't play an important role, but their duty is first and foremost to be subservient to a greater, more esteemed hero. But this is also a two-way street. The bigger knight needs to set a good example and exist as an inspiring figure that the smaller knights want to serve and hopefully emulate. The two most common types of armagers are the Warglaives and the Halverins. And to make up for their smaller size, they're normally deployed in hunting packs of two to three individuals. The Warglaives are noted for their particular bloody obsession with close quarters aggression, their primary purpose to get in close and absolutely tear the enemy apart like a rabid war dog. They're equipped with a terrifying thermal spear and a whirring reaper chain cleaver. A thermal spear is basically a stripped down version of a knight errant's thermal cannon, and a single shot from this melta weapon is capable of vaporizing even the most heavily protected of combatants, melt through the wall of a bunker, or reduce a battle tank to molten slag. If the first shot from a thermal spear isn't enough to kill their prey outright, it will almost surely cripple them, giving a group of warglaves time to move in like a hungry pack of predators that will encircle the victim before pouncing, ripping and tearing into them with their chain cleavers until nothing is left but an eviscerated carcass. The Halverins, on the other hand, exchange the close-range armaments of the Warglaive for a pair of Armager autocannons that are each capable of firing hundreds of armor-piercing shells per minute. Just one of these weapons alone is capable of absolutely shredding entire infantry lines or tearing apart lightly armored vehicles. But with two of these things equipped, and normally a pair of identical knights offering supporting fire, a pack of Helverins is capable of unleashing a withering torrent of high-powered rounds that can stop an enemy assault in its tracks. I'll also quickly mention the Knight Moirax, as this was another type of armager utilized mostly during the Great Crusade before the outbreak of the Horus Heresy. But even back then, their use was extremely situational. They were noted for having access to particularly destructive weaponry, including graviton pulsers, conversion beam cannons, lightning locks, volkite weaponry, and even the infamous rad cleansers. Regardless of what weapons they took, they would additionally be outfitted with an ionic flare shield, which, although similar to ion shields, was significantly larger and thus covered a wider area of the war machine at the cost of reduced overall protection. The big problem with these guys was that because their equipment was so powerful, they had to be outfitted with a particularly potent reactor core. This thing was notoriously unstable and thus presented a danger to not only themselves, but all of their allies as well. These things are no longer built in the 41st millennium, and a surviving one of these suits is said to be both exceedingly rare and viewed as a sacred relic of a bygone era. Most of the time, when somebody pictures an Imperial Knight in their head, the thing that they're going to see is a Questorus Pattern Knight. These are by far the most common in universe and are the ones that utilize the iconic and immediately recognizable design that we're all familiar with. Such was its popularity that during the time of the Horus Heresy, this thing would end up being reconfigured into a ton of different patterns that each utilize different hull configurations and weapon loadouts. The most commonly utilized patterns being that of the Knight Errant, the Knight Warden, the Knight Crusader, the Knight Galliant, the Knight Paladin, and the Knight Preceptor. Before we talk about all of the different Questorus patterns, we should first touch on their similarities, as they're all built off of the same frame. Each and every one stands approximately 30 feet tall and is both heavily armored with a combination of thick adamantian plates and an ion shield. The former being one of the hardest substances known to mankind and is, fun fact, actually the material both used in the frame of a Terminator suit and the Eternity Gate within the Imperial Palace on Terra. 
said to be the final threshold one must cross before standing before the Golden Throne and the Emperor of Mankind himself. The Ion Shields, on the other hand, are a directional defensive force shield that works by projecting energy in a narrow arc in front of the knight. A lot of times people end up confusing these with Void Shields, which is the shielding system utilized by a Titan. An Ion Shield does not fully cover the entirety of the knight, and in a sense, works in a similar manner to how a real human knight utilizing a sword and shield would. The Ion Shield can only cover one quadrant at a time, and must be continuously rotated to deflect incoming attacks. They require an exceptional amount of training to be utilized properly. In addition to this, Questorus Knights normally have four primary weapon system mounting points, that being both of their arms, a carapace mounted weapon on their back, and finally a smaller weapon built into their chest that normally takes the form of a heavy stubber or a multi melta. Now, I'm sure the scions of a knightly household would take great offense to me calling all of their Questorus knights basically the same thing with different weapon loadouts, as each and every one of them has a great deal of historical significance, tactical applications, and an esteemed legacy of use in their own right. But to keep things simple, all of these knights are basically the same thing with different weapon loadouts. It's kind of like how the humble Rhino chassis can be built into like 12 different vehicles, all with different roles and names, but at their heart, they're all Rhinos. The Knight Errants are specifically designed for close range combat and can commonly be found leading the charge on the front lines, eager to get into the fray and hungry for their preferred prey of enemy tanks or other war engines. They are each armed with a massive thermal cannon on one arm and either a Reaper Chainsword or Thunderstrike Gauntlet on the other. The former being an absolutely massive chainsword equipped with diamond hard cutting teeth that are all driven by sanctified turbo actuator engines. These things can eviscerate or dismember enemy combat walkers with a single well-placed strike. And any machine or monstrous creature unlucky enough to be stabbed by such a monstrous blade will be eviscerated with explosive force, reduced to a blizzard of blood and gristle or glistening armor fragments in the blink of an eye. Although less commonly used against infantry, the tactic is not unheard of. The combination of the knight stomping feet attacks as well as the blade reaping across lines of human combatants has given it a rightfully fearful reputation. For all intents and purposes, a knight errant is basically a much larger and more deadly version of a warglaive. Not only do they have a lot of similarities in their weapon loadouts and tactics, but they also traditionally have similar personalities. The pilots of the Knight Errants are traditionally younger nobles known to be a bit hot-headed, and the suit's machine spirit traditionally mirrors this personality type. Once they've located their prey, they will unleash a searing beam of heavily destructive energy from the thermal cannon to cripple their target before charging in to finish them off with the chainsword. The Knight Warden is nearly identical to the Knight Errant, but they ditch the thermal cannon for a weapon known as an Avenger Gatling Cannon a firearm capable of unleashing a furious hellstorm of large caliber shells that can tear apart even the most impressively armored of foes. Additionally, mounted on the underside of the chain cannon is a massive heavy flamer used to flush enemies out of cover. The combination of heavy flamer, gatling cannon, melee weapon of choice, and long range missile system mounted on their carapace make the Knight Wardens an incredibly well-rounded combatant that is not only lethal at every range, but also particularly unlikely to be caught off guard, which is something that more specialized knights tend to struggle with. Despite their versatile, well-rounded nature, you may be surprised to hear that the Knight Wardens have something of a reputation for being particularly difficult to control. First and foremost, the pilot must be skilled at combat engagements in close, medium, and long range, which is something that takes a lot of training to be able to accomplish effectively. To exacerbate this problem, the machine spirit of these knights is noted for being particularly stubborn, belligerent, and aggressive, and is prone to impulsive acts of selfless aggression on the battlefield. Due to this combination of factors, wardens are rarely piloted by anyone other than the most esteemed of veterans within a knightly household, normally a veteran baron or a member of the house's esteemed court. In all honesty, this makes them something of a status symbol. Being able to successfully pilot such a difficult ornery steed is the mark of an exceptionally skilled scion. It kind of reminds me of the old stories where there's a horse that won't let anyone ride him. He's just got too much of that wild spirit in him and bucks everybody who tries off. And then the main character comes along and manages to tame this wild stallion and the two end up becoming inseparable. It's basically the same thing going on here. 
So the Knight Errant and the Warden are pretty similar, the only major difference other than the personalities of the Machine Spirit being the change in primary firearm. The Knight Galleon, on the other hand, swaps out their primary firearm in order to dual wield melee weapons. Traditionally being equipped with both a Reaper Chainsword and a Thunderstrike Gauntlet, which is essentially a massive power fist that crackles with barely contained energy. Merely clenching the fist together is enough to cause shockwaves of energy to pulse out and sparks of incandescent fury to lash about in sizzling arcs. When the fist strikes its target, it releases a deafening thunderclap of powerful concussive energy that is so ridiculously powerful it can crumple the heavy armor of an enemy war engine as if it was made of wet paper. The sheer force of the blow is capable of sending towering monsters or vehicles flying backwards, crushing waves of infantry under their giant shattered bodies. It is even said that these things are strong enough to smash into the heavily fortified legs of an enemy titan, sending them toppling to the ground and effectively eliminating a much larger, more dangerous combatant with a single strike. Culture and tradition varies from household to household, but there is a set of three tenets believed to be commonplace amongst all Knight Galleon pilots. Trust in your ion shield, make all speed towards the foe, and always strike swift and sure. Now, to come face to face with any knight in combat is certainly a terrifying experience, but that's taken to an extreme with the Knight Galleons, as what could possibly be more terrifying than facing a 30-foot tall war machine? Uh, facing a 30-foot tall war machine that's dual wielding melee weapons and charging right at you in a full sprint like a crazed and frothing berserker. The demoralizing effect they have on the enemy is so severe that they will often attract a disproportionate amount of enemy firepower, as the foe desperately does everything it can to prevent these crazed machines from reaching their front lines. These guys are like a titanic wrecking ball of barely contained fury that stomp forward into the enemy lines set to unleash the maximum amount of carnage, their chainsword sweeping low to butcher ranks of enemy combatants in an avalanche of swirling adamantium teeth, while their thunderstrike gauntlets punch through the chest cavities of enemy war machines to rip out their beating mechanical hearts and hurl them into the distance at another enemy. So whereas the Galliant has opted to go full melee mode, on the other end of the spectrum we have the Crusaders, that have laid down their swords in favor of being a dedicated long-range weapon platform. Each of these guys carries more firepower than an entire tank squadron, and they offer long-range support to their kin in the form of an Avenger Gatling Cannon and a Rapid Fire Battle Cannon a terribly powerful large caliber artillery cannon that utilizes an automatic loading mechanism, which allows its wielder to unleash a stream of high explosive shells at a remarkable rate without sacrificing accuracy, every shot firing two shells simultaneously. Fun fact, the sound this weapon makes is so iconic that guardsmen that have fought beside them in a past battle traditionally refer to them as bringing quote, the twin thunder to the enemies. This multi-purpose cannon is effective at blasting holes in massed infantry formations, wiping out squadrons of light to medium vehicles, and even engaging in long-range duels with enemy artillery pieces. Between this and their Gatling cannon, the Crusader is capable of unleashing an absolute hellstorm of firepower that not only obliterates everything that stands before them, but sends waves of terror rippling through the enemy. The Crusaders are normally not piloted by high-ranking barons or members of the Exalted Court, and their pilots are often noted for being especially dutiful and selfless, humble or pious in nature. They don't seek the glory of close quarters kills like other knights, and they're not interested in carving out their own personal legacy. The only thing they care about is the safety of their kin. In order to do this, the Crusader will normally move into an open field position in order to ensure maximum visibility and maintain wide open fire lanes. Once their area of control has been established, they'll keep their brothers and sisters safe by unleashing a non-stop barrage of long-range supporting fire, picking off enemies that get too close to the knights under their watch and eliminating unseen threats before they can become a problem. The only drawback here is that they leave themselves wide open with no one to cover for them and have to rely fully on their ion shields to keep them safe. If a particularly skilled combatant manages to flank them, then they'll be in trouble. But the Crusaders don't care about that, and in their mind, the risk is worth keeping those they care about safe. Fighting alongside a crusader means that there will always be somebody that's watching your back, and needless to say, they've earned an enormous amount of respect within their house. They're seen as loyal, dependable comrades who will never fall short of their chivalric duties. 
Whereas the Galliant and Crusader both have a very specific type of combat role they fulfill, the Paladins on the other hand are something of a jack of all trades style knight, armed with a Reaper chainsword, a rapid fire battle cannon, and a long range carapace mounted missile system of their choice. Now, rather than focusing on one particular type of combat engagement, they instead focus on their versatility and ability to face any threat at every range. This has secured for them a place as a strategic backbone to the vast majority of knight lances. They're so popular, in fact, that it's considered an extreme rarity and something of a taboo if a knightly fighting force doesn't include at least one. House Hawkshroud, for example, has long referred to their paladins as the soul of their knightly host, whereas something like a knight errant is often piloted by a younger knight fresh out of their becoming. The paladins are on the opposite end of the spectrum, and are almost always piloted by a seasoned noble whose experience allows them to get the most out of this adaptable and effective suit. Out of all of the knights we've talked about so far, none of them truly embody the chivalric code of the knightly houses more so than the knight preceptor. Everything about these guys is designed to emulate what it truly means to be a knight. Honor and chivalry are everything to them, and although they are primarily a close-range combatant, their mentality is radically different from something like, say, an errant. They believe that no matter how deranged or evil their opponent, they must show them respect by fighting them in close quarters. It is the belief of all preceptor pilots that the only honorable kill is one that was made while looking your opponent in the eye. And when you go to finish them off, it has to be done with a decisive and clean strike, done in the Emperor's name. The Preceptors have no desire for glory and have no wish to humiliate their opponents. And though they may hate their enemy, they feel it's part of their duty as an exemplar of honor to show respect for the fighting prowess of those they've been sent to kill. They wield both a Reaper Chainsword and a relatively rare yet equally terrifying firearm known as a Laz Impulsor a devastatingly powerful laser cannon that works by building up a concentrated salvo of energy before dispersing the enormous charge down poly-sanctified conduits and escalating pulses. The projectiles are lightning fast and are capable of stripping force fields from enemy war engines or hammer through even the heaviest of armor to annihilate their enemy's vital systems. Whether on or off the field, the Preceptor's primary goal is to set an example for all other members of their household to follow. They often do this by tracking down the largest and most fearsome of enemies, marching fearlessly across the battlefield, enemy fire ricocheting off their plating, their Laz impulsors unleashing a screaming volley of concentrated energy that cripples even the most resilient of enemies, before finishing them off with a single lethal blow from their chainsword. If you know me, you know I have something of a soft spot for chaplains over in the Loyalist Space Marine forces, and the Preceptor embodies a lot of the same qualities. They're almost always piloted by the veterans of at least a dozen wars with decades of experience. When not engaged in battle, they attend to their duty of training young squires in the tenants of their household, as well as the principles of honorable combat. Whether those under their charge take the form of young nobles who will eventually pilot a questorus pattern knight of their own, or the bondsmen who will accompany the preceptor in an armager suit. Although the training of a squire can be rigorous and demanding, the Preceptor understands that it's nothing compared to what they're going to face during the ritual of becoming. They seek to imbue within their wards a firm sense of discipline and a steel resolve to ensure they experience a successful bonding and then in the future will go on to be a prime example of knightly honor in their own right. Now, needless to say, they command an enormous amount of respect within their households, and even barons or exalted court members will watch their tone when meeting the steely-eyed gaze of the preceptor pilot that mentored them in their youth. Okay, so now we're going to jump to some of the big boy knights, and we're going to start with the Dominus pattern, of which there are two distinct variants, the Valiant and the Castellan. The Knight Castellan is both a towering fortress bastion and a mobile artillery platform that is bristling with weaponry so fearsome that merely the sight of one of these things on the horizon is enough to break an invading force. Their enormous frame is capable of mounting a vast array of long-range weapon systems that allow its pilot to begin hammering the enemy at extreme range the moment the fighting begins. Traditionally, they are equipped on one of their arms with something known as a plasma decimator, an obliterative firearm capable of bathing swaths of the battlefield in searing energy that vaporizes entire regiments in the blink of an eye. Whereas on the other arm, they wield what is known as a volcano lance, an absolutely enormous las cannon that can punch searing craters in even the largest of super heavy war engines and monstrous creatures alike. They can core out the chest cavity of a lumbering squigoth or even behead an enemy titan. 
When several of these knights unleash the firepower of their volcano lances at the same time, the effect is said to be similar to the lance batteries of an Imperial Navy warship. On the Castellan shoulders, they have these things known as twin siegebreaker cannons and a shieldbreaker missile rack, the former being a system of gun turrets that are controlled by servitor brain subarrays slave to the pilot's targeting systems. They unleash a bombardment of heavy ordnance that carpets an area of the battlefield in flame and shrapnel, cutting off advancing infantry or breaking an incoming charge. The Shieldbreaker missiles, on the other hand, are an ancient and powerful variant of hunter-killer missiles that combine both a Raptorus machine spirit and Empiric Cascade microgenerators. These things are able to bypass enemy energy shields as if they didn't exist, and they do this in a rather strange way. You see, once the missiles are in flight, they begin to rapidly flicker in and out of existence, rapidly shifting back and forth between the physical and immaterial universes every single microsecond. What this means in practice is that the exact moment they're about to make contact with an enemy shield, they disappear and reappear on the other side of the barrier, striking the target directly with zero interference. These missiles are, of course, very situational, but are incredibly punishing against cowardly enemies that have the offensive tendency to try to hide behind energy shields. Before we get into the Valiant, it's worth pointing out that both patterns of Dominus Knight are admittedly more alike than they are different. For example, they're both capable of overcharging their ion shields and spreading its area of effect out in a wide area in order to offer protection to nearby allies as well as themselves. It's also worth pointing out that this action is considered incredibly offensive when done to shield for other knights who have ion shields of their own, but is greatly appreciated by other Imperial factions, specifically men and women of the Astra Militarum. However, the Valiant differs in one key way, in that although it is still considered a massive weapons platform, it is designed to carry its heavy payload directly into the fight itself, not simply standing on the edge of the battlefield and offering long-range support like its counterpart. The Valiant is capable of unleashing so much devastating punishment in such a short period of time that their enemies are simply incapable of fighting back or enduring under the relentless assault. You can honestly think of these guys as the knight household's equivalent to an ancient battering ram, a device capable of breaking apart even the sturdiest of castle gates, or as is more often the case in the 41st millennium, decimating the core of an entire army. They ditch the Plasma Decimator and Volcano Lance of the Castellan in favor of what is known as a Conflagration Cannon and a Thunder Coil Harpoon Launcher. Now, although these weapons may seem simple and somewhat primitive, looks can often be deceiving. The Conflagration Cannon is essentially three building-sized flamethrowers, all linked together and fed from absolutely enormous Promethium reserves. When fired, they spew forth an inescapable firestorm that reduces everything in the vicinity to blackened ash. The enemies of mankind purged in the searing flames of the Emperor's divine judgment. The Thundercoil Harpoon, on the other hand, is exactly what it looks like, a launcher that fires an enormous spear made of pure adamantium, linked to an unbreakable chain. If the massive projectile doesn't kill the enemy war engine or monstrous creature outright, the Valiant can activate the weapon again to reel their quarry back in. While they're fishing their prey in, the Valiant will send out a massive electrical charge that causes arcing electrogeist to leap all the way up the chain, through the harpoon, and directly into the chest cavity of their prey, literally cooking them from the inside out. So with that, we've covered all of the knights that you'll commonly see depicted in the 41st and 42nd millenniums. But for the sake of completion, there are a couple of other patterns that I feel we should touch on that were commonly utilized during the Great Crusade and specifically during the Heresy. The first of these patterns was known as the Serastus, and it came in four known variants, the Acheron, the Castigator, the Lancer, and the Atropos. These knights are more similar to a Questorus than a Dominus, but the first thing that you're gonna notice when you look at them is that they're a bit taller, skinnier, and seemingly more lanky. Proportionally speaking, they appear as if they were designed to look more human, and this is because they have different historical origins from their chunky brothers and sisters. The Questorus Knights were originally created tens of thousands of years ago by the first human colonist to help not only defend their fledgling civilizations from raiders, but more so to help with everything else that they would need, like mining, logging, building of settlements, etc., etc. The Serastus Knights, on the other hand, were built specifically for war. Due to their slender design, they are much more nimble than the Questorus Knights and are marked by a legacy steeped in bloodshed and terrible violence. 
The Lancer pattern was designed specifically for rapid close combat assault tactics and was known for its lethal flanking charges. They were modeled after the legendary lance-wielding cavalry of ancient Terra and would utilize their enormous shock lances to duel against titanic foes. Despite their rarity, they are a prized war machine held in high regard by more impulsive house scions. The Knight Castigator, on the other hand, was made specifically to deal with hordes of lesser foes, as it was armed with a fearsome Castigator pattern bolt cannon that was capable of obliterating enemy formations in a thunderous rain of mass reactive explosions. The Knight Acheron was known as a battlefield reaper, designed not only to destroy, but inspire both terror and appearance in the manner in which it went about slaughtering. They possessed a particularly deranged machine spirit and were filled with the souls of Knight Scions that relished in carnage. So fearsome was their reputation that they came to be seen as a warning, that if you saw one of these guys on the battlefield, you knew the knight household that you were fighting against meant business. They would be employing scorched earth tactics and would show you no mercy. That despite the knight's traditions of honor and chivalry, these notions were going to be set aside in exchange for a policy of extermination. Their existence was seen by the households as a grim necessity, and very few knight scions would willingly choose to pilot such a morbid machine. There was also the Serastus Knight Atropos, which are considered to be the rarest of all Serastus patterns, as they were made for a very specific role during the Heresy, the destruction of Heretech engines and Xenos war machines, whose existence was considered a blasphemy to the Omnissiah. You gotta remember, around this time, demon engines and the creations of the Dark Mechanicum were a relatively new thing, and thus a machine equipped with a machine spirit known for its cold, all-destroying hunger was needed to ward off the constant risk of madness and insanity that would commonly infect pilots who fought against such diabolical creations. The final type of knight that was known to exist was the Acastus pattern, and these things were so friggin' enormous that most people who saw one for the first time in Universe and Out commonly mistake them for a variant of Titan. They're the largest and most heavily armored of all knights, and even during the Great Crusade, they were considered incredibly rare, as very few houses had the resources available to muster more than a couple of these suits. So destructive was the weaponry they bore, they were capable of rivaling even the smallest of titans in one-on-one -on -one combat. To the Mechanicum, they viewed the Acastus as a sign of battlefield supremacy and an icon of the machine god's divinity, a symbol of control and of lethal sanction. To the knight households themselves, however, they came to represent something far more grim. They serve as a supreme enforcer of the rule and dominion of a household over its scions. And many of these suits bore the heraldic symbol of the Shrouded Urn, an icon given to a knight that had destroyed one of its brothers in sacred and sanctioned trial by combat. Whatever the issue, slight, or crime may have been, it was often determined that a battle to the death was the only appropriate course of action one that would be carried out by one of the most powerful knight suits in existence. Those who laid eyes on such a monstrous war engine were constantly reminded of their place within the house, that hubris and arrogance would not be tolerated. Only the most legendary and skilled knight scions are capable of piloting such a massive and powerful steed, as you have to remember these things are as big and heavily armored as a warhound titan, something that normally has a crew of at least three individuals, traditionally a princeps interfacing with the god engine's machine spirit and a pair of Moriartys who assist both in piloting the titan and commanding both its weaponry and sensor arrays. Knights, however, are only ever piloted by a single scion, no matter how big they are, so the pilot of an Acastus pattern must bear the enormous mental and spiritual strain of piloting the entire thing by themselves. To take control of one of these things is to push the human mind and spirit to its absolute limit and can only be endured by incredibly rare pilots of insane mental fortitude. The Porphyrion variant is equipped with a pair of twin-linked Magna Laz cannons, whereas the significantly rarer Asterius pattern wields a pair of ancient conversion beamer cannons, which when focused on a specific target cause a subatomic implosion that literally tears all matter in the targeted area apart. Both are also equipped with a secondary weapon system, such as a carapace-mounted mortar battery, iron storm missile pods, Helios defense missiles, auto cannons, secondary las cannons, or even Iriad cleansers, which are particularly disturbing weapons that thankfully have mostly fallen out of fashion. Radiation-based weaponry nowadays is often viewed by members of the Imperium as not only dishonorable, but needlessly cruel, sometimes even being called a war crime. 
These things were capable of unleashing a powerful blast of cross-spectrum radiation that would cause all infantry caught in the blast radius to suffer a horrific death as they were boiled alive from within and blasted apart on a cellular level. It's honestly no wonder these knights had such a fearsome reputation. In order to understand the knights, we have to go all the way back to the beginning during the Dark Age of Technology. If you're unfamiliar with it, this is a period of time that stretched roughly 10,000 years from the 15th millennium all the way up until the 25th. It was humanity's golden age, where it seemed like we were capable of just about anything, and built machines that people living in the 41st millennium would view as godlike. This period of human enlightenment, unfortunately, wouldn't last forever, and the end of the Dark Age of Technology was marked by one of the bloodiest and darkest periods of human history. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's bring it back to the 16th millennium, as it was during this point in time that the species would take its first steps towards conquering the entire galaxy. Humanity would end up sending out vast fleets of scouting vessels, with the singular purpose of documenting planets that would be suitable for colonization in the future, specifically worlds that were rich in natural resources. Whenever such a planet was found, the scouts would mark its location and continue on their journey. After thousands of these planets had been located, the next step, which was referred to as the Long March, was to send thousands of colony arcs that were filled to the brim with human settlers out in every direction each and every one of them locked on to one of these recently discovered planets. This was a one-way trip. There was no going back for the colonists, and they would have to be entirely self-sufficient in the new world. Because their spacefaring vessels would no longer be needed, they were designed to be cannibalized for parts in order to establish their very first settlements. And whether pieces of the ship were stripped out wholesale and repurposed into things that planet-locked colonists would need, or its components be broken down into raw materials which would be utilized by the STCs to construct anything they could possibly need. Although some colonists most certainly lucked out and landed on relatively peaceful worlds with no hostile Xeno species to speak of, uh, the reality is the vast majority of them were likely incredibly dangerous. Some of them were filled to the brim with esoteric hazards, from deadly atmospheric shifts, terrifying plagues, strange environmental fluctuations, or hazardous and dangerous terrain whereas others were already inhabited by hostile aliens, whether they be a sentient species that had already colonized the planet and didn't take kindly to these new intruders, or were more primitive predatory life forms, some of absolutely gargantuan scale. Now, the STCs were capable of producing all kinds of machines the humans would need to defend themselves, whether they be vehicles, small arms, fortresses, etc., etc., but there was one thing they were capable of making that by far was more useful, practical, and all around just a lot more badass than everything else. The towering multi-purpose bipedal exosuits of colossal scale that we know as Imperial Knights. Though at the time, they probably went by a different name, as the Imperium wouldn't exist for another 24,000 years. Anyways, these things could do just about everything, whether they be used to stride through extreme environments unharmed, quickly and effortlessly clear entire forests like giant logging equipment, aid in the construction of new buildings and fortresses, or more importantly in the context of Warhammer 40k, fight off and eradicate any hostile Xeno species that would attempt to interfere with mankind's pursuits. These knights served as the iron fist of interstellar human colonization, and were a major contributing factor to the successful carving out of new realms for mankind to prosper in. In fact, over time, these knights and their pilots would end up being revered by the peasantry they protected, eventually becoming the first ruling class of these new worlds, as such was the reputation and authority of those who commanded the knight's suits. There's still a lot of mystery surrounding exactly how most of the technology in 40k actually functions, and we don't have a lot of insight into the inner workings of the knight machinery from way back in the day, but there is evidence to suggest that the early scions would be subjected to the same mind-altering properties that scions of the 41st and 42nd millennium would have to deal with. Notions of honor, duty, nobility, and fealty would be reinforced in the psyches of all those who sat upon the throne mechanicums, and over time, they would organize themselves into something of a series of noble households. This ruling class that controlled all of the knights viewed it as their sacred duty to protect the borders and ensure the safety of their feudal subjects. The mundane tasks such as farming, mining, and physical labor were beneath the knight scions, who now had to focus on much more large and grandiose tasks, and thus they would redirect their efforts into ruling their kingdoms and protecting their populations. 
while lesser men would handle just about everything else. And I just want to take a second to really put this in perspective, as I personally find it incredibly interesting. In the very first days on these new worlds, the pilots of the knights were simply men and women doing their jobs. They were basically glorified forklift drivers. But as years turned into decades, decades into centuries, and centuries into millennia, the descendants of these forklift drivers became the ruling class, the defenders of their kingdom, and in some aspects, many of the peasants may have seen them as divine. They went from everyday working men and women to legendary heroes to kings and queens that ruled by divine right, all because one of their ancestors lucked out and got a degree in civil engineering. And I'm sure there were some notions of superiority going on here, because of course there would be amongst royalty. But looking at their traditions and values, it seems pretty apparent that they truly saw the value in labor. Working with one's hands and putting in a hard day's work was seen as honorable and something to be proud of a mindset that is going to become very important shortly and will end up saving them from utter annihilation. But once again, I'm getting ahead of myself. As these ideas became more commonplace, we started to see a shift in the aesthetic of the knights and the populations they ruled over. Whereas at first, we can imagine the early colonists and their machines to have looked like something out of a high sci-fi movie. Over time, it began to look more and more like a techno-feudalistic society. The knight's rugged utilitarian exteriors would be decorated and armored in the full panoply of war, complete with banners, paintings, and symbols that befitted their station as the ruling elite. So let's jump forward in the timeline to between the 22nd and 25th millennium, which most assumed to be the start of the Age of Strife. Up until this point, everything had been going pretty great for humanity. We had successfully spread out across the galaxy, and back on Earth, the colonization technology had gotten exponentially better. The original ships had to make their journeys the old-fashioned way, by either putting their colonists into suspended animation or simply existing as a floating world where they would be expected to live and die, their distant descendants being the ones that would eventually inherit the destination planet. The ships they were sending out now, however, were capable of warp travel, something that makes simply going the speed of light look exhaustingly slow by comparison. Not only this, but AI had advanced to the point where there was seemingly nothing it wasn't capable of accomplishing, and humanity had become completely reliant upon it. Many of the new worlds being colonized by humanity during this period were absolutely flooded with thinking machines that did everything for them. The outdated technology of the night worlds and their exosuits were made to look downright primitive by comparison, and if it wasn't enough for the species to have reached its technological zenith, something even more remarkable was starting to happen. The species would see the birth of the very first psychers, individuals capable of manipulating reality with nothing but a thought. Now, I should mention it is believed that psychers have always existed in some capacity throughout the timeline of humanity's existence, but they were so inconceivably rare that they were thought to just be a myth. But right now, at this point in time, they were being born in mass. In those early days, this was not seen as a bad thing. Far from it, this was amazing. The species was taking a huge evolutionary leap forward. Many assumed that their original goal of simply conquering the galaxy was now beneath them. Humanity was going to ascend to something far beyond what anyone could have possibly conceived of. We were taking our first steps towards godhood. However, as most of you watching this video are painfully aware of, that didn't exactly end up happening. In fact, things were about to get real bad real fast, and we were about to witness the near extinction of the entire species. The first major problem was that there was no system in place to control humanity's rapidly growing psycho population. There were no schools or programs in place to teach them discipline or how to safely harness their abilities. And hell, they were so new that there wasn't even any real societal traditions to guide them. It would be like if half of the babies born from today onward were being born with quite literal superpowers. Things would start getting out of hand real quick. Because of this, a lot of these psychers would end up going mad with power and become ruthless tyrants in their own right. Madmen capable of wiping out entire centers of industry or population centers with a single thought. And at the exact same time, all of the AI that humanity had become reliant upon, i.e. the men of iron, would end up rebelling against their creators. Humanity was facing two apocalyptic scenarios at the exact same time, the machine uprising and the plague of psychers, 
On one hand, you have artificial androids that are superior to human beings in every conceivable way, purging all life from a planet, while on the other hand, you have all these psychers that, in the pursuit of their own selfish agendas, were progressively going ever more insane. Every single time they utilize their gifts, they open themselves up to the warp and thus all of the demonic entities that live there. Possession and demonic manipulation became commonplace, and in many apocalyptic scenarios, these psychers would end up mutating into literal warp portals, wherein full-on demonic incursions would burst forth into the material realm, ready to slaughter everything in their path. If things somehow couldn't get any worse, at this exact moment in time, the Eldar's rampant hedonism and debauchery was causing a disturbance in the warp, a psychic footprint that was gestating and growing into a new chaos god. Slanesh, the Chaos God of Excess. The infant god was generating so much tumultuous energy that massive warp storms began plaguing the physical universe, literally cutting off every human world from one another. No communication, no travel, no reinforcements. Everyone had to face the horror of the Age of Strife completely on their own, and most of the human worlds didn't make it out alive. But with all that said, what were the night worlds up to during all of this? Well, as world after world was consumed in the fires of war, the night worlds went pretty much ignored during this period. All of the things that led to humanity's downfall in the first place were things that these planets had rejected. Ironically, their stubbornness would end up being their salvation. Their populations were noted for being incredibly superstitious and didn't like things they didn't understand. So when it came to new technology and the AIs being produced by mankind, they rejected them to instead focus on the revered technology of their ancestors, as well as the tried and tested methods of survival that were an extension of mankind's hard work, rather than a replacement for it. And when it came to psychers, they would unfortunately be executed for witchcraft. The Night World's backwards primitive way of thinking ended up actually shielding them from the horrors that were unfolding all around them. As the lights began to go out across the galaxy, the Night World shored up their defenses, stoked their watchfires, and continued on into the future, defending their borders with grim tenacity. They would exist like this for thousands of years, completely cut off from the rest of humanity until the Emperor's Great Crusade got underway in the 30th millennium, with the goal of reuniting all of the lost human worlds. The very first Night World to be rediscovered was done so by rogue trader militant Jeffers. Now, even though the ravages of time had not been kind to this civilization, and aside from their giant bipedal war engines, they were pretty primitive, he saw a lot of value in them, and upon reporting his findings, recommended that these knights be folded back into the Imperium, as their value as a military asset could not be overstated. He also argued that if one of these night worlds had survived, then there potentially could be hundreds if not thousands more of them out there. And the army of night suits was one thing, but perhaps even more importantly, these worlds were absolutely lush with natural resources. Because of the night world's population's practice of essentially mining by hand or with simple machinery, the worlds hadn't been completely stripped. And on the technology side of things, as they had gone through the Age of Strife mostly unscathed, they had access to tons of STCs and other pieces of lost archaeotech. Now, it should go without saying that worlds full of lost ancient technology, ruled over by giant mechanical warsuits, got the Mechanicum absolutely frothing with excitement. They demanded they be given exclusive rights to send envoys out to these worlds, but unfortunately for them, their requests for exclusivity were denied. Everybody wanted a piece of the Night Worlds, whether they be rogue traders, members of the Mechanicus, Imperial officials, members of the Administratum, etc., etc. Everyone wanted to be the one that brought them into the Imperium and thus carved out a nice slice of all of their treasures for themselves. However, when these envoys from all of these different factions finally touched down planetside for first contact with the planet's rulers, they were taken aback by just how primitive they really were. Alongside the giant night suits, they also witnessed feudalistic cities bedecked with flags and banners, townsfolk using horses and water-driven machinery, engines that ran on coal and steam, and even the ornate castles, the homes of the ruling nobility, seemed like they had been ripped directly out of one of the surviving historical documents depicting ancient Terra. This gave many of the visiting diplomats a false sense of superiority. They were these haughty visitors from a comparatively advanced society that literally descended from the stars themselves. And these people were just a bunch of primitives. 
I can't put into words just how absolutely blindsided they were by the calculated political brilliance of the knightly nobles. They might not have known much about flying ships and fancy technology, but they were incredibly cunning and shrewd politicians. The visiting envoys were outclassed in the negotiation department in every conceivable way. This is because during their time of isolation, the knightly nobles had to deal with centuries of infighting and social conflict. It was basically a Game of Thrones type situation on every single one of these planets, if Game of Thrones also had giant mech suits involved. Most of them were not ruled over by a single household. Far more often, there were several, if not dozens, all with their own political interests. Because of this, negotiations and politics in all of its forms was something that the ruling class had extensive experience with. They were very good at seeing the lies behind the promises laid at their feet, and thus were very careful with any alliances they forged. Many of the diplomats that came to these planets would not make any form of headway with the seemingly stubborn knightly households, and thus would end up departing flustered and empty-handed. The Mechanicum, however, would not be deterred, and as the Great Crusade ended up rolling across the galaxy, they would establish hundreds of new forge worlds, and many of them being suspiciously established right next door to a couple of night worlds. Every single time this happy little coincidence would occur, the senior magi of the forge world would waste no time dispatching missionaries to their new neighbors. They came bearing the word of the Omnissaya, and with it, millennia of concentrated wisdom. They would establish good relationships with the knight households by sharing resources, information, and establishing trade. But the biggest thing that these tech priests were offering was the knowledge needed to maintain and repair their knight suits. The artisan class placed in charge of taking care of these suits could only do so much with the limited technology they had available. And after having been in operation for thousands of years, many of the knights were nowhere near operating at optimum efficiency. Many of their higher functions had ceased entirely. Armor had been riveted or even strapped down into place. Damaged weapons were replaced with crude alternatives, such as actual literal iron lances that would buckle after a few hits. Their ion shields had all long since burnt out, and many of the suits even had their damaged reactors replaced with makeshift electrical, solar, or even steam-powered systems. Not only did the Mechanicum demonstrate that they could restore these suits to their former glory, but they promised that they would teach their craftsmen and armorers all of the knowledge and techniques needed to be able to do this themselves. And I don't think it's possible to truly put into words how big of a deal this was to both the knight households and the people they ruled over. It was a blessing beyond anything that any other diplomat could have possibly offered them. Their entire society had been built on the backs of these machines. They were as much a utilitarian tool as a symbol of reverence, profoundly linked to their cultural identity. Now, the Night Scions were not idiots. It was very clear the Mechanicum had ulterior motives for seeking an alliance and sharing all of their wisdom. But even still, this was an offer that couldn't be refused. Opinions varied from household to household. Some of the night worlds unquestioningly swore allegiance to the Mechanicum, surrendering their autonomy to enter into an unbreakable bond of loyalty with the neighboring Forge world. However, many more worlds were hesitant to entirely give away their freedom, even if they were thankful for the Mechanicum's gifts. Instead, they would end up joining the Imperium, as being an Imperial world meant that they could still operate as their own independent fiefdom so long as they were paying their tithes. In doing so, they would be establishing an alliance with the Mechanicum, but wouldn't be surrendering their freedom and becoming part of it. This is where we get Night Worlds being either Questor Imperialis or Questor Mechanicus. A quick side note, it's important to remember that at this exact moment in history, the Mechanicum and the Imperium have signed the Treaty of Mars and are incredibly close allies, but the Mechanicum is still considered to be its own entity. It wouldn't be until after the Horus Heresy and, more importantly, the Schism of Mars, where the refugees of the Red Planet and all members of the Mechanicum that remained loyal would be reformed into the Adeptus Mechanicus, officially becoming part of the Imperium. Whereas the traitors who joined with Horus Lupercal and had successfully taken over the Red Planet during the Martian Civil War would maintain the name of Mechanicum. And in the far future, these traitors would continue to call themselves the True Mechanicum, whereas their enemies would come to refer to them as the Dark Mechanicum. But that's a topic for its own video. These are terms that tend to confuse new people, so at this moment in time, the Adeptus Mechanicus doesn't exist. There's only the Mechanicum, and they are not part of the Imperium, but are in alliance with them and are coexisting. Now, you may think that the Mechanicum of this time would see the Night Worlds joining the Imperium as some kind of slight, 
but in actuality, they were totally okay with this. They were here to play the long game, and what they would do next was admittedly pretty sneaky. You see, regardless of the world's decision on whether to join the Mechanicum or the Imperium, they upheld their promise to teach all of the members of the Artisan class how to maintain and repair knights. All of these individuals would end up being flown off-world to the neighboring Forge world, where they would be taught everything they needed to know about proper maintenance rituals, how to maintain their knights, and all other forms of technology that could be found on their planet. Back then, and even to this day in the 41st or 42nd millennium, these artisans normally undergo an apprenticeship on the Forge world for a period of about 10 years before returning to the Night world. The fun fact, this apprenticeship is nearly identical to the one that tech marines go through within the Space Marine chapters. Anyways, individuals who completed the apprenticeship would now be known as sacristans and sent back to the Night world. But here's the sneaky thing about all this. The Mechanicum didn't just teach them a bunch of maintenance rituals, but also indoctrinated them into the cult of the machine, making sure they were firm believers in not only the divinity of the Omnissiah, but were strict adherents to all of the dogmatic traditions of the machine cult. These individuals now had a dual loyalty to both the world of their birth and also the Mechanicum, which was now the institution of their faith. And it's implied that for the majority of them, if their loyalty was ever questioned, they would side with the Mechanicum first and foremost. So now the knightly nobles have a problem. They could finally maintain and repair their suits, but the only people capable of doing this were no longer loyal to them. It's important to know that the artisan class from before all this had always been viewed in high regard on the knightly worlds, but they were always just a vassal of a noble house, never a truly powerful political entity in their own right. However, the Sacristan Brotherhood that replaced them would end up gaining a considerable amount of political power. At any moment, if they felt like their advice was not being heeded, or that their or the Mechanicum's needs were being ignored, they had the power to withhold information and refuse their services. Over time, the Sacristan Brotherhood would end up becoming arguably as powerful as the noble households themselves, which was definitely a shakeup that caused quite a bit of tension. More importantly, because of the Sacristan's dual loyalty, they also existed as a network of Mechanicum agents that could further the interests of the Tech Priest of Mars without the Mechanicum ever having to get directly involved. However, over time, this would just become the new normal, and the formation of the Sacristan Order is largely seen as a net positive overall as it benefited the knightly nobles more than it hurt them. On one hand, the services they provide are invaluable, and on the other, it's proven to be incredibly beneficial to have another voice at the table in matters of politics. The Sacristans act as something of a counterpoint to the naturally arrogant and warlike tendencies of the knights, and on numerous occasions they've been solely responsible for ending generational feuds between houses. They also ensure that no matter what the discussion, the Mechanicus's interests will always be represented. And important side note, the dual loyalty of the Sacristans is mostly only a problem for Questoris Imperialis worlds, as those who would give themselves over entirely to the Mechanicum had no issue with the Sacristans. In fact, the people of these worlds and thus their noble houses would also become firm adherents to the machine cult as well. At the end of the day, what this means is that even though there are many night worlds that stubbornly claim to still be independent of the Mechanicum, the tech priests were successful in their mission to infiltrate and assimilate the night worlds into their operations, regardless of which side they chose. In the 41st millennium, the knightly households are dependent upon the Mechanicus for their continued existence, but like all things, views on this vary from individual to individual, and for the most part, even though the knights were and still are fully aware of the Mechanicus' intentions and always view them with an appropriate amount of suspicion, at the end of the day, they will forever be grateful for what they did for them, and feel they owe them a great debt that can never truly be repaid. Today in the 42nd millennium, you will always see somewhere on a knight's heraldry at least some symbol of respect for the Mechanicus, and normally taking the form of the iconography of the cog, a constant reminder of the great debt they owe the Martian tech priests. As the Great Crusade rolled on, the Night Worlds, whether they be Questor Imperialis or Questor Mechanicum, would hold as bastions of military power. The knightly nobles would take to the stars to aid humanity in its efforts of reuniting the galaxy. Over a period of decades, tens of thousands of knights would stride the battlefields of the Great Crusade, slaughtering Xenos empires and crushing all human worlds that refused to submit to the will of the Emperor. 
When the disastrous Horus heresy struck, the knights were not completely immune to the corrupting schism that plagued the entirety of mankind, and a large amount of them would end up turning traitor, later becoming known as the Chaos Knights, but we'll cover them in their own deep dive. However, the vast majority of night worlds would end up remaining loyal, as the nobility of their worlds had been spiritually conditioned by their throne mechanicums for thousands of years. The same system of beliefs and traditions that kept them safe during Old Night increased their spiritual resistance and warded off the corrupting influence of chaos. This isn't to say they were completely immune, as there are many examples of entire households becoming corrupted, but they did fare better than most. With their honor intact, they would take the fight to the traitors alongside their loyalist allies, eventually defeating the treacherous Warmaster and pushing the forces of chaos back into exile within the Eye of Terror. To this day, the surviving night worlds are considered vital linchpins in the Imperium's defense network, protecting all of humanity from the heretic, the witch, and the alien, crushing them wherever they may be found. At this point, there's something of a running joke between me and my wife, that I have a tendency to try to make everybody cry at the end of my videos, and I'm not gonna lie, I have been guilty of that in the past. One of my favorite things about Warhammer 40k is just how bombastic, over the top, and admittedly sometimes a little bit silly its setting can be on the macro scale. But when you start reading all of its stories, when you start to dive deep into all of its characters, you begin to see that it's so much more than just a bunch of bolter prawn. The depth some of the Black Library authors are capable of portraying in Warhammer's characters, settings, events, and themes never cease to amaze me. What can I say? I like when media makes me feel things, and I do my best in my videos to try to capture the way these books make me feel and impart that to anyone who watches my videos. And the great tragedy of Warhammer, the deep underlying sense of melancholy that permeates throughout its stories, the grim darkness of it all if you will, is an aspect of these tales that I do my best to highlight. But I'm just going to be honest with you. After spending the last two weeks on this video, literally doing nothing but reading about Imperial Knights day in and day out for well over a hundred hours, I really struggle to find anything to highlight here. I would dare say that they are by far the least grimdark faction in the entirety of the Imperium, and barring maybe say the Tau, they may just be the least grimdark faction in all of 40k. They seem to be doing a lot better than just about everybody else in the grimdark future. I mean, sure, they live on medieval, feudalistic worlds that have rejected technology and the peasant population literally tills the fields by hand, but as far as the lore tells us, they're happy with their lot in life. It's a simple life, full of hard work, but it's an honest one that the peasantry are proud of. Which, if I'm going to be honest with you, if given the choice, I would much rather live on one of these night worlds as a peasant than on a hive world as a cog in the imperial war machine, where I'll most likely end up dead on a manufactorum floor. The knightly nobles are said to be hot-headed, arrogant, and are always looking for an excuse to go to war, but honor, fealty, and chivalry are everything to them. Being honorable and acknowledging the honor of others is so important to them that in the middle of a war zone, they'll march out and challenge the biggest, strongest enemy they can find. Oftentimes, a 30-foot-tall demon of hatred and rage, the literal personification of evil itself. And they'll show it respect by fighting it in close range and not utilizing any cowardly tactics. Which, you know, might not be the smartest of tactical decisions, but it's certainly badass. Even their relationship with the Mechanicus and the Sacristans is one that causes a lot of conflicting feelings in me. On one hand, they were infiltrated by the Mechanicus, who brainwashed a portion of their population to push their own agenda. And even though the Knights are aware of this, they still honor all of the oaths they swore to them thousands of years ago. Because from their perspective, the gift they gave them of being able to repair their Knights that were the cornerstone of their cultural identity was a blessing that they can never truly repay. However, there is one thing about them that I can't quite get out of my head, and I'm going to be honest with you as I'm sitting here reading out this portion of the script that I wrote at 3 in the morning, the night before this video is scheduled to go live, I haven't quite figured out how I feel about this, and that uncertainty creates a certain level of discomfort in me when I think about what the knights really are. So bear with me as I work this out for myself. Part of the novelty of the Knights as a faction is their identity of being a relic of a bygone era, a group of people pulled directly out of the ancient history of Old Earth, a coalition of worlds that are seemingly out of place in time. But this isn't simply a temporary aesthetic, 
It is not something that will wear away over time as mankind continues in its pursuits of reclaiming the galaxy. The Knights are slaves to the past, shackled to their ancient history, and in many respects are quite literally incapable of progress. This is due to the throne mechanicum and the ritual of becoming that they subject their ruling elite to. By undergoing the ritual and bonding with such an ancient and powerful machine spirit, they sacrifice who they are as an individual. Large portions of their mind and personality are replaced with the notions and ideals of ancient heroes and long-dead lords. Every single Knight Scion, in a sense, is an amalgamation of the values of their ancient ancestors and the machine spirits of the suits themselves. The true horror of the ritual is not what they must overcome, but what they must give up. Although they may emerge from the Chamber of Echoes triumphant, having enacted a successful bonding, the reality is that they left behind everything that made them them. All their hopes and dreams, values and morals, their ideals for the future, and even their sense of humor, one could make the argument that they died on those thrones. And since these are the same men and women who will mold their societies, craft their laws, and influence their world's population, so too is the entire world slave to the will of the ancestors, their entire society frozen in time, unwilling and incapable of moving forward. And I just gotta be honest with you, if that's not grimdark, I don't know what is. But none of that really matters. So long as the enemies of mankind lurk in the dark places between stars, so long as the forces of chaos continue to corrupt the minds and hearts of humanity, and the foul Xenos abominations hunger for the flesh of men, the Imperial Knights will forever stand ready, stoking their watchfires, ready to deliver the Emperor's divine judgment as an instrument of his will. And no matter what happens, no matter if mankind successfully reclaims the galaxy, or the brittle pillars of the Imperium finally give way and the great empire of humanity inevitably crumbles to dust, the Knights will endure. They survive for thousands of years on their own, and they will do so again, continuing on into the future the way they always have, unbroken and unchanged.